exalt your word above everything else in the name of Jesus Christ you brought a message for us today that is an eternal message a life changing message a destiny molding message uh, a message of equipment spiritual equipping I'm asking oh God uh, that you speak through me and use my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to inscribe revelationally upon the tablets of the hearts of your people in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh God, that by the reason of this message you are sending, O oh God, lives will change. Amen. Stories will change for the better. Amen. Strength will be released. Amen. Grace will be released. Amen. Transformations will take place. Amen. For we all beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are transformed into the same image we see in the mirror. From glory to glory as by the spirit of the Lord. Fulfill this in the midst of your church today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you almighty father. Do that which only you can do. Amen. Bless us immensely. Amen. Bless us eternally. Amen. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have your seat. God bless you. I greet us. Good morning in the name of Jesus. I want to thank the pastor for the privilege to stand on this altar, I want to thank the Men's Fellowship of Jesus Center for the privilege to be called 
to stand at this gate to talk about men at the gates. Right now, I am standing at a gate. We are standing at a gate. By the time we go into the unraveling of God's word, you will understand quite well what I mean by this. As we begin this prophetic exploration, permit me to humbly dedicate this message to honor the memory and the legacy of a man who stood to serve faithfully at various gates in the journey of time and has gone through heaven's pearly gates into eternity. I'm referring to Elder Professor S.I. Oladeji. Let me hint you three areas where he stood at gates. In fact, if that's all I do today, I'm sure you will get the understanding of what it means for men to stand at gates. He stood at a, a gate that I call the gate of scholarship, where he guided generations of men and women through these gates of scholarship. People who came as novices into the world of research, and he guided them, supervised them. I don't know how many they are, many PhDs, many MSCs. He guided them into academic distinction, so much so that in his lifetime, a good number of them came to the class where he was, that is, a professor. Number two, he also served faithfully and stood formidably at the gate of leadership as an elder in Jesus Center Church and a trustee of the Christ Dominion Team International. I remember my first day in Jesus Center at Bolapat Building. When I came in, I didn't come in before the service started. The one I saw there, I think it was my first time of seeing him, was Elder Oladeji, giving the announcements. Giving the announcements. One area of thought that he stood in his ministry. And then, maybe the subsequent Sundays, he led the testimonies. It was later on I found out that he was also standing at another gate. Because between 2010 and 2014, and I think I came to Jesus Center in 2010 or 2011. Between 2010 and 2014, I understood that he was the provost of the postgraduate college of OAU. I really didn't know that it was a provost I saw standing there giving announcements in a local church. It was later I came to know, and it was immediately after his provostship that I became a member of the postgraduate college since 2014. You know, I met his successor on the seat, and I was told of the reformations he did. At that time, you know, processing of forms used to take donkey times. You know, because every member of the board will have to sit down to scrutinize. And so it was during this time, the wisdom of God came that they should divide into four groups. And they began to handle the cases at Progrogis College on group basis, faculty by faculty. And it made things, you know, better. So he stood formidably at the gate of leadership as an elder and a trustee of CDT. His memory shall remain blessed and his legacy glorious in Jesus Christ precious name. Amen. Amen. Men at the gates. There are many scriptures but I'll read a few for sake of time and point out to the rest. But this I want to tell you is a life, once in a lifetime message. That's the way I felt about it. I was given this message before the recent incident and I began to meditate. But it was after the incident that I really sat down and I knew that this is not a message I've ever preached before. I've never preached before. I preached about five years ago. The theme of our ministries was keys, doors, and ways. Keys, doors, and ways. And in the course of it, I read a lot, I studied a lot, I meditated a lot about gates, but not as much as I've had to do in the last couple of days. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 18, where we have read three verses. Then the Lord appeared to him. The him who was here was Abraham by the terrible trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Let's start from there. Abraham was sitting in the tent door. Where was that? The gate of his house. 
the gate of his house. This was a man who didn't have children yet. Only two people were in that house, except for the servants. Abraham and Sarah. But he did not vacate, he did not abandon the gate of his house. He was not like Adam, whom on the day that a visitor came into the house, he was nowhere to be found. And the visitor found the wife, only the wife at home. And that visitor was a terrible visitor, a dangerous visitor. The devil that came into the serpent. And because the man was not at the gate, humanity entered into tragedy. The devil came in, infiltrated the bliss of Eden. Infiltrated the serenity of Eden. And things have not remained the same for humanity except for redemption that came through our Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam, who has restored us back and given us back a position higher than what the first Adam had. But Abraham was at the tent door. He was at the gate of his house. What was he doing? He's doing what I recommend to every man. And let me say as we go on, this message is not only for men, it is primarily for men the man gender, the male gender, but it is for every one of us as you are going to see as we go on. Because gates are not situated only in the domain of men. You are going to find out that there are, there are gates everywhere. Gates everywhere. And I pray that our eyes will be open today to see the gates where you are meant to be standing and doing something. Because that's, by the time we round off, three things I want to have achieved. Number one, that every one of us will identify the gate or gates where we are meant to be standing. And that will make a commitment to the Lord to stand at those gates doing what we are meant to be doing. Amen. That we will never abandon our gates. As I sat here, the Lord spoke something to me that didn't speak to me before. He said, gates are never meant to be empty. Gates are never meant to be empty. It is when gates are empty that disasters happen. It is when gates are empty that things that ought not to occur, occur. Gates are never meant to be empty. And so the Lord will open our eyes to identify, to discover the gates that we are meant to be standing on and we begin to do all we are meant to do. So the Lord appeared to him by the terrible trees of Mary as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Imagine if this man was not at the gate because those three men were not ordinary men. What was happening at this gate of his house was that heaven was intervening in the affairs of earth. There was a meeting at that gate between heaven and earth. If this man was not at the gate at that moment, they would have passed by. And the things that occurred thereafter may never have occurred. I will not go into the details of what occurred. But you'll find the details in the latter part of that chapter. From, you know, verse 17. Let me read verse 17 to 21 very quickly. And then you'll read the rest of verse 22 to 33 on your own. And the Lord said, Shall I hide? That's verse 12, 17 of Genesis 18. A number of things that occurred. They had had some dialogue. And then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, I pray that will be my portion and your portion, the portion of every man seated here in the name of Jesus. Every man under the sound of my voice, what God spoke concerning Abraham shall be our portions. We shall surely become great and mighty nations. God is the one who is a specialist in turning a man into a nation. He does it over generations. He ensures that generations do not end, they continue. That's why he's able to say that he's able to bless generations unto the fourth 
generation. He's able to do it. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, what gave God that confidence that Abraham was going to be a great and mighty nation? And he said, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. He said, for I have known him. For I have known him. Does he know you? To what extent does he know you? What does he know about you? Irresponsibility, non-availability, carelessness, non-challenge. What did God know about Abraham? For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household. God was testifying concerning a man that whatever I hand over to this man will not die in his hands. He will command his children. And he will command them in such a way that even when he's not there, his children will command their own children. They will transmit the message generationally. God was confident about that. That's why he was saying, whatever I want to do, I will not hide it from my servant and my friend. It was only a few people that were called the friend of God in the Holy Scriptures. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. That they keep the way of the Lord. This is the work of men at the gates. That they keep the way of the Lord. To do righteousness and justice. That the Lord may bring to Abraham. What he has spoken to him. And then the Lord brought in. An issue that was touching his heart. And felt. Let me share this issue. With my friend Abraham. Verse 20. And the Lord said. Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very great, I will go down and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will not. Let me say a few things about this. Like I said, verse 22 to 33, let's read them on our own. But let me make this cogent comment. Abraham was keeping watch and guarding the gate of his house. He was sitting by the tent door in the heat of the day. He could have said it's so hot today. I need to leave this domain. No, he was sitting there in the heat of the day when he could have had enough excuse to abandon the gate. It doesn't matter how tough the times are in Nigeria or all over the world. Men, stay at the gates. Stay watching. Stay guarding. Stay protecting. Four things I'm going to take us through by the grace of God in this message. One, we're looking, we're going to look at what gates are. We are going to ask what gates are, and God will give us the answer. We're going to ask why gates? What's the significance of gates? Why do we need, particularly men, to be at the gates? Why? When you know how valuable something is, then you will take it seriously. If you know how important this instruction from God is, then you begin to take it seriously from today. And then we'll look at two or three models, examples, portraits of men at the gate. Then we'll look at a particular gate, the gate of fatherhood. And we'll say a few things about the gate of fatherhood and the message will be concluded. Already, some of these are coming in what we are sharing thus far. So Abraham was keeping watch and guarding the gate of his house. As every man ought to keep watch and guard the gate of your house. If every other person is asleep and you need to be awake, you must be awake as a man of the house. Sitting by the tent door in the heat of the day and God appeared to him. He knew his gate. Do you know your gate? And he took the proper posture of a watchman, of a defender, of a protector. A watchman, a defender, and a protector. Listen to me. Men who identify, who recognize their gates, and who stand at their gates, never remain small. Can I say that again? We often talk of greatness. The secrets of greatness are simple. Men who identify and stand at their gates never remain small. That's why God was able to see us shortly. He will become a great and mighty nation because he doesn't abandon his gate. He stands in his place of responsibility and they are destined for greatness. 
men who take command at the gates of their territories and who have learned to command their generations, they become commanders under God. Men who take command at the gates of their territories, whether it is the home, whether it is the family, whether it is the community, whether it is, uh, you know, at a, at a neighborhood level, whether it's at a national level, wherever someone has learned to take command, he will become a commander under God. Hallelujah. Now, Abraham went beyond the gate of his house. And then he went into the gate of intercession. By the time you read Genesis 18, 17 to 33, after the Lord introduced to him that, look, I want to go and see what is happening. And the three angels departed. They departed to go to Sodom. The Bible says, Abraham remained with God. He wasn't ready for disaster, for the destruction of Sodom. He felt, there's another gate. Apart from the gate of my house that I've been protecting, I've been watching over, that I've been defending, I don't think God should tell me he wants to destroy a whole city, particularly a city where my nephew is. And I will say, well, go ahead and do what pleases you. Because there are people who have answered God like that. God will say, I want to do it. Just go ahead and do it because they feel they have no stake. Abraham felt, no, 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 no. It was like Moses. God said, Moses, let me wipe out this entire race. I start another nation by you. Moses said, no, 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 don't do that. Lest the, the, the healthy world will say, this, their God is a destroyer. He just brought them out to destroy them. And he interceded for Israel. Here, Abraham, who actually should look at Lot and say, well, is not, 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 not that rascally boy who decided to go and choose, you know, the things that please his eye. Good riddance or bad rubbish. No, sir. He began to plead with the Lord. If there are 50 righteous people there, Lord, will you spare? God said, I will spare. If there are 45, I will spare. If there are 40, I will spare. If there are 30, each time he pleaded with the Lord, that's the work of the intercessor. And may I say, the man in the house, sometimes we think that women are prayer warriors. Yes, they could be. Very emotional. Most women are very emotional. But the bottom line is that the man of the house is the watchman. Another watch for what, man for watchman is intercessor. The man of the house is the one that makes sure there are no breaches in the wall. There are no openings where servants can creep in. He's the one that will keep awake when every other person, including the wife, are woke and say, tired and they are slept. The man will say, I'm going to watch. Is the one that will go to open the rooms of the children and be sure that they are sleeping well. It is not, the mothers do it, but you see, we can get to the point in which we gender, you know, relate some of these responsibilities and we hand them over. And the man will say, well, that's the mother's business. No, sir. You are the intercessor. In actual fact, you are the prophet, you are the priest, you are the king in the house. You are the prophet, you are the priest, you are the king. Don't abandon your prophetic gate. Don't abandon your priestly gate. Don't abandon your kingly, you know, gate. Many of us are more familiar with the kingly gate. Don't you know I'm the man of the house? You know? It's a role. Yeah. But the work of a king is not just to enjoy royalty. The work of a king is to exercise dominion. Hello? Hear it for the, if it's for the first time you are hearing it, let it be written. The function of the king is not so much the grandeur of the king and the royalty and the paraphernalia and all of the shining things of kingship and royalty. No, the ultimate function of the king is dominion. That's why a king is called a king. And the word kingdom comes from the word king and dominion. Kingdom. The king's dominion. The main function of the king is dominion. And Christ has called us kings and priests. And we shall reign with him. Our main function as believers is dominion. Hallelujah. So, the angels had departed for Sodom. And Abraham remained as an intercessor at the gate pleading for, to God for mercy until he came to 10 and he knew, I can't go further. Now, I don't know why he stopped, but I think it was because he was very, getting very close to the fact that, you know, the only people that may be left may just be a lot and his, uh, and his wife and his family. And the chapter was closed. Nonetheless, 
God still showed mercy upon Lot and made sure that Abraham, if all of this you're pleading is because of your, your nephew, no problem. Even if I will, you know, I will not fight, fight, I will still bring out these ones. Praise the name of Jesus. But look at Genesis 19. I want us to see it. So we can compare it with Genesis 18 that we read. Genesis 19, 1 to 3. Men at the gates. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. Did you see that? At the gate of his house? No. At the gate of Sodom. The gates in those days were where the leaders of the cities used to stay. Lord put greater priority of, of, of communal leadership than the priority over his own home. By the time you see the details of his home, you know that his home must have, should have been his priority. Because that home was a corrupted home. That home was a home where a lot of the evils in Sodom had entered. But he preferred to be identified with the leaders of Sodom. A city that was known for corruption and, uh, you know, and worldliness. Uh, so that was where it was found. <laughs> Psalm 1 tells us, Blessed is the man, let me read this so I don't misquote it. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. This man was sitting at the gate of Sodom, where the wicked were, where the ungodly were, where the scornful were. He was not separated from the world. Like God tells us, be far away from them. Separate yourself and I'll be a God unto you and I'll be your father. No, not Lot. Not Lot. The same Sodom, he was eyeing from a distance and eventually got there. Now he had become entrenched in Sodom. He was settled in Sodom. Sodom had become his pattern. He was among those who were sitting at the gate of Sodom. What was his business there at the gate of Sodom? Well, it could have appeared there once in a while. But why must that be where heaven will meet him? Heaven met Abraham at the gate of his house, watching, defending, protecting. Even without children inside, just his wife, himself and the wife. Heaven met Lot at the gate of Sodom. Where will God meet you if he appears to you today? At what gate? Which gate is your priority in life? You must decide. Thank you, Holy Spirit. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his Lord does he meditate day and night. On and on. It will be like a tree planted by the river's water. Unlike Abraham who sat at the gate of his house, Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. I ask you again, at what gate are you sitting? At what gate are you standing? Who are you sitting or standing with? At whatever gate you are in. Evil, communication, corrupt, good manners or good conducts. Show me your friends and I will show you your destiny. What am I doing at whatever gate that I'm in? These are the questions we want to settle in our hearts today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What are gates? What are gates? We could give common definitions. A gate is an exit or entry point. An exit or entry point into a place. Gates are a part of everyday life. We use gates to mark our boundaries, to keep unwanted intruders at bay. Gates are typically found at the entrance of buildings, and they are often closed. But they can also be open to welcome visitors or guests. If you have a gate, you know, in your house, I'm sure when you go to bed at night, before you go to bed, you lock the gates. Am I right? Oh, yeah. Because that's part of the function of great. So protect, to defend, to mark your boundary. If it's just to mark your boundary, well, it can just be a decorative gate that 
People know that well, that gate is there. You can open it back and forth. But when protection comes in, it must be locked. You don't want any intruders. Only the people who are permitted must enter. We are seeing gate in its natural setting. And the better we understand it, the better it will be for us to appreciate the spiritual significance and meanings of gates. Physically, a gate is a movable barrier or demarcation used to close an opening in a wall, in a fence, or in a hedge. Now listen carefully. Gates can be entry points into a house, into a compound, into a community. In architecture, I mean, the, the field of housing, we talk about gated communities. And I'm sure you've been to neighborhoods where you know that you can't just bump into the neighborhood. Everyone who wants to enter a gated community will have to go through a control point, the gate. And some of them in Lagos are actually, they have all of these CCTV. You can't just bump in. You can't just say, well, I want to go and visit somebody. They will say, has he invited you? They will, you know, use the intercom to call the person. Those are So if human beings know that they have to put gates in certain issues of their, you know, context of their life, uh, you think that God is dumb? That doesn't know about gates. Whatever we are doing here is a reflection of what he does. Or what he knows. Or what he knows we ought to do. Amen. So there are gates to houses. Gates to compounds. Gates to communities. Gates to neighborhood. There are gates to cities. There are gates to nations. That's why you can't just decide. Next week I want to go to America. And you go to the airport. You say I bought my ticket to America. You can't even buy the ticket. Because the ticket will be sold to you on the basis of a visa that you have obtained. So without a visa, you can't enter a nation. And if when you get a visa and you get to the airports of destination where you are going, they will still scrutinize you. There are people who have gotten visas, they go to the airport and they check, did a few checks and they say, get a flight back to where you are coming from. Because the gate cannot permit them. They feel that there are, there are dangers to the society. So there are gates everywhere. We may not have seen them because they are not physical gates. They are everywhere. And there are more spiritual gates than physical gates. Praise the name of Jesus. We need to come to this enlightenment and walk in the light of this revelation. Doors allow access or prevent entry to a room or to a home. Gates are usually more imposing. Yes, what I'm saying is doors and gates have similar functions. But when you say a gate, you are talking physically about something that is more imposing than a door. That's why you can see gates that are, you know, three meters tall. But most of us will not have three meters, you know, doors into our house. The average door you will have is six feet, you know, 2.1 meters. Because a door is not meant to be as gigantic, you know, as a gate. Gates are meant to guard the access to large spaces, to cities, to estates, and to eternal life. To eternal life. Nobody can, can rush into heaven. Nobody can break into heaven. No. There are gates. Hallelujah. In Bible times, most cities were surrounded by walls. And so gates were a constant feature in people's lives because it was a time of military conquest here and there. So hardly will you see a, a, a city without a gate. When you check the Bible stories, you read about Jericho. The walls of Jericho. The gates of Jericho. Read about Ai. The walls around Ai. The gates of Ai. Only God was able to break through. The walls and the gates of Jericho. So gates can prevent and control the entry or exit of individuals. Gates function as a defensive structure. And so on and so forth. Let's go to the types of gates. We are still answering the question, what are gates? The types of gates that we find in scriptures. There are physical gates and there are spiritual gates. There are natural gates. There are supernatural gates. There are social gates. There are economic gates. There are political gates. You saw what happened in March, February, March. People were struggling to enter through the gates. Only one person entered and became the president and the vice president. And the others were told, go to court. Because the gate, that particular gate, cannot contain more than two people. The presidency in Nigeria is president and vice president. Any other is overload. And they can be permitted. And there can be no two presidents. You can see the, the handing over. The old president has to be eased out. The man he was eased out, did he go back to Asso Rock? No. He went back to his house. 
Because there is order in creation. And whatever order we see on earth is patterned after the real world. So there are political gates, there are spiritual gates. In the scriptures, gates were not only found into cities, but also into camps, into houses, into temples, into palaces, into temples. Let me say something there, even though I will not elaborate on it. Have you heard the scriptures saying, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are not going to dwell on that today. I just want you to take hold of it. So that as you, as you meditate on the issue of gates, you will know that, oh, the man of God did not go into the details of this, but it's an area for me to look at. Amen. This body, there are gates into this body. And this body is the gate into the soul. And the soul is the gate into the spirit. So what your eyes, the gate of the eyes, see, is very important. That's why Job said, I uh, made a determination and a commitment that I will not look carelessly on a woman. Because lucre is what took David to adultery. And adultery led him to murder. Because he didn't guard the gate of his eyes. The gate of your ears. Your senses, your physical senses are gates into your body. Even the gate of your mouth. What you eat and what you speak. Because the mouth performs, is one of the organs that performs so many multiple functions, you know, among the organs of the human body. What you eat, what goes into you, and what you speak, what comes out of you through the mouth. But please take that aside, keep it for study. That, oh, there are gates into my body. Oh, yes. There are gates into your soul. Yes. There are gates into your spirit. That's why the wise man said, Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it, I think Proverbs 4.23, for out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart. Make sure you don't leave the gate of your heart open to anything. Be selective about what you look at. Be selective about what you listen to. Be selective about what you touch. Be selective about who you associate with. Because once they enter through the gates, you don't know the damage that can be done. But no damage shall be done into my life and your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are gates of the soul through the body. But let me emphasize the most important gate that is in this book. He's a person. His name is Jesus. Amen. He's the only gate to God. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. In John 10, 7, he said it very, very emphatically. Then Jesus said to them, most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The NIV says, therefore Jesus said, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Hallelujah. He is the gate for the sheep. And I plead with you, if you have not passed through him into eternal life, today is your day. Because everything I'm saying will just be secondary messages. If you have not known the one that is the gates, without him, there is no breakthrough into heaven for anyone. Without him. People can eulogize their religions from here to there. It's unfortunate. Without Jesus, religion does not take anyone to the heavenly father. There are gates in heaven. There are gates in heaven. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. There are many other gates, but Revelation 4 1 tells us, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. For John, the beloved, it was a gate of revelation. Right from John chapter, I mean, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, you begin to see the visions flowing. Revelations flowing. Why? Because the gates of revelation was open. And from that time, Heaven was downloaded on earth for John the Beloved to partake of all that was going to be happening in heaven and for all of eternity. Praise the name of Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ also spoke about two gates. The narrow gate and the wide gates. You find that in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 to 14. I'm just sharing all of this. They are not the core of the message, but 
By the time you are studying on your own, know that the Bible says a lot about gates. It talks about the narrow gate that leads to life and the wide gates and the wide way that leads to destruction. The way to the Father, the way to salvation, the way to life is narrow. So don't follow the crowd. Because our majority carries the day. No, sir. Not to heaven. Don't think it's, ah, it's, a, it's a mega church. Ah, no. The only reason you want to be in that church is because it's a mega church. No. The opposite is true about entering the enemy. There are many gates on Satan's road, but they all lead to destruction. And they are very wide. But the way to lead to life, that leads to life is a narrow gate. Interestingly, the devil tries to copy everything that God does. So because there are gates to heaven, there are gates of hell also. And we would not have known if the Lord himself did not say it. In Matthew 16, 18, he said, Peter, you are the rock. Your name is Peter. Upon this rock of revelation that you said, I am the Christ of Lingo, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell, what John says, the gates of hate, is the same thing, shall not prevail. So there are gates of hell. But God says they will not, not prevail against us. And what the Lord is saying is there, if we can quickly pick that, he was saying the authority of hell. In that instance, the word gate is standing for what? Authority. Upon this rock I will build my church and the authority of hell will not prevail against my advancing church. Many people think the church is standing and hell is advancing against us. No, that's not the picture. The picture is a dynamic church, a church that is moving, bombarding the gates of hell. The people of Rebecca spoke to, you know, prophesied over Rebecca. They said, your children shall be mighty and they will possess the gates of their enemies. So it is the church that is meant to crush the gates of hell, not the church in defensive, trying to say the gates of hell will not prevail against us. No. Get that picture correctly. It's a moving church. It's a dynamic church. It's a militant church that is bombarding the gates of hell and they cannot prevail. We're going to rescue every soul that is rec rescuable from the hold of the enemy and bring them into the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. So why, what do scriptures say about gates? Many more things the scripture says. These are very important for you men and for every one of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The gates of the ancient cities were tall, wide, massive. Tall, wide. I read about one gate that was written in, in Acts chapter 3. Uh, that was where Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And what was the name of the temple gate? Beautiful. Well, it was a gate. Amen. There was a gate. And something happened at the gate. But you know, theologians made us to know that that gate was made of brass and required 20 men to close it. Can you imagine? A gate that is made of brass, not the you know, decorative gates that we have today. 20 men will be required each time to close that gate that was called beautiful. And at that gate also, heaven impacted the earth. Don't forget this. This is one of the most important things that happens at gates. And why we must be at gates. A lot of times when God releases heavenly manifestations, it meets people at gates. Hallelujah. Here, heaven impacted the earth. And a lame man received the miracle. In Joshua chapter 2 verse 5, just take note of these references. We don't have time you know, to zoom to them. You know, I, I've written some of them here. In John chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible says the gates were shut at midnight and it happened that the gates being shut when it was dark that the men went out. That is, the gates, even in the olden times, were shut. Why? For protection. Because gates are meant for protection. Not only that, in the Hemai chapter 7 verses 1 to 3, not only were they shut, but there were people that were called gatekeepers. And this is a very important word. Men, you are gatekeepers over your house. I'm a gatekeeper over my house. Amen. When God puts me in a position of responsibility, authority, may not be in the home. Every HOD, head of department, you're a gatekeeper over the department. 
They won't call someone else if something is happening relating to the department. The dean of a faculty in a university is the gatekeeper. The president of Nigeria today who said, I'm prepared for the job, I applied for it, is the gatekeeper over Nigeria. This fiscal entity that's called Nigeria. At every gate, there must be a gatekeeper. When the gatekeeper is absent, that's when terrible things happen. Just like it happened over the, the last four and eight years of the last presidency. Many times the gatekeeper was not available. And you saw pass were taking hold over the gate. And so everything was just muddled up. He would say, well, I'm not corrupt. That's by the way. Who manned the gate in your absence? So at every gate in life, there must be a gatekeeper. What gate are you keeping? Going back to our question. What gate am I keeping? Gates were the chief point from which enemies attacked. That's why Deborah sang in Judges chapter 5, verse 8. He said, the Bible says, Deborah was singing. Go and read the, 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 the song of Deborah in, in Judges chapter 5. Part of what she said in verse 8, he said, there was war in the gates. That's where war takes place. There was war in the gates. And that's why the gates must never be abandoned. In Acts chapter 14 verse 13, when Paul and Barnabas visited Lystra, the city of Lystra, to minister, and they met the people of Lystra, they were idolaters. What the Bible say? Gates were known for the performance of idolatrous acts. In Acts chapter 14 verse 13, then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and gallons to the gate, intending to sacrifice Will they, so in those days, idolatry in any city, in any community, took place where? At the gates. Because you see, the spiritual principle is, once the gate is conquered, the city is conquered. Whoever owns the gates, whoever possesses the gate, has possessed the city. So when idolatry has taken over the gate of a city, then of course idolatry has taken over the entire thing. Praise the name of Jesus. Mekasku prenish takaliabu santa. Lebrubusha. In Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3. News came to Nehemiah. And there were two main things about the news. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. And the gates are burned with fire. That's what provoked Nehemiah to say, no, no, no. Something must be done. He came before the king. And he was standing at a gate also. He was the king's cup bearer. And the king looked at his face. He didn't say anything. Nehemiah was the problem. And he aired his problem. Why? Because the issue of the gate of Jerusalem had burdened him. He could not keep it from, you know, from his, 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 his composure. And the king said, is that the problem? I'm going to release resources. And of course, resources were released to rebuild Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Wisdom speaks at the gate. Proverbs 1, 21. She cries out in the chief cornerstones. At the openings of the gate in the city, she speaks her word. We, I'm looking at scriptural references. I'll show you so much that God has to tell. And then from these references, we bring out certain salient points about the significance of gates. Wisdom speaks at gates. Proverbs 121, she cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. Psalm 24 and verse 7. Lift your heads, you gates. Be lifted, you ancient doors. So that the king of glory may come in. So the opening of a great gate symbolized a royal welcome in certain instances. The opening of a gate symbolized a royal welcome. In Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 18, God spoke, I think to, to, to Moses, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates. And he was given the instruction to the people of Israel. You shall appoint, notice what I'm saying? Judges and officers in all your gates. It's like God telling the pastor, you shall appoint officers over evangelism, officers over intercessory unit, officers over the ushers. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? So the heads of those units are standing at gates. You'll be held accountable for what happens. You are the pastor. You are the gatekeeper of that unit. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates. Not, not just superior gates. No, all your gates. 
which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So, judges and officers served at the gates, administering justice. Leadership is appointed at the gates. Leadership sits at the gate. Leadership serves at the gates. At the gates over families, over organizations, over congregations, over sub-congregational units. Hmm. Second Chronicles 18, 19, 18 and verse 9. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne. Where did they sit? And they sat at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. So what was happening here? Council of state meeting was taking place at the gate. Council of state meetings. So when today the council of states in Abuja is meeting, that's a gate. Every decision that will be taken, they've had this first one a few days ago, at that meeting will, will you know, stream down to every Nigerian, whether he understands what is going on or not. Leadership flows from the gate. Wisdom is released on the, on the gate. Decisions are made at the gate. Hallelujah. When a dean is sitting at the gate of a faculty, he's going to decide who is going to be admitted, who is not going to be admitted. When the provost of the PG college is sitting as a provost, he has a strong hand to decide who is going and who is coming. Praise the name of Jesus. All of these are gates. And they are gates for which we will give account to our God and our maker. May we be able to give worthy accounts in the name of Jesus Christ. The word of God was read at the gates. I will spare the, you know, the reading of Nehemiah chapter 8. Read Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 2 and verse 3. They read the word at the water gate. So that's why I said, right now I'm standing at a gate. Amen. Because whenever the word of God is being read, that's a gate. Whenever the word of God is being preached, whoever is standing there is standing at the gate. That's why I don't joke with holding the microphone and ministering to God's people. It's a gate. It's a gate where destinies can go down by what I speak or can rise. It's a gate where I can speak encouragement or slice discouragement through someone's hand and this person says, I will never go to church again. It's a gate. It's a gate where wisdom is meant to flow. It's a gate where decisions must be made. And I can speak words that will make you to go home and say, this is the time for this decision. That decision you have been afraid of taking. And God says, I'm backing you up. And you take it and you have no regrets. Because somebody stood at the gate to speak what you need to hear so that decisions can be made about your life. It's where destinies are determined. Hallelujah. So gates are entry and exit planes with deep symbolism. The people enter through gates to worship the Lord. Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praises. There are gates everywhere. Listen to this very carefully so that you can think. And when we are able to think, we are able to thank. Every human being, irrespective of class, race, or gender, passed through a gate to transit from the womb to the world, including me, including you. Every human being, every human being, even our Lord Jesus Christ, passed through a gate to transit from the womb to the world. And there are children who didn't pass through the gate successfully. That will not be our portions in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do gates symbolize? They can symbolize territory, defense and security, authority and dominion. Gates symbolize the place of announcements and pronouncements. When the A and PC of a university is meeting, that's a gate. That's a gate. Where they can say, well, he has to wait for another two years. And nobody will question them. Once the chief at that gate, the, the chief servant at that gate says, he's pronounced. He's pronounced. Pronouncements are made at the gate. Announcements are made at the gate. Decisions are taken at gates. Wisdom cries to be heard at the gate. Leadership flows is provided from the gate. Direction is sought and received at gates. 
provisions and services are offered at the gates. So gates symbolize protection, transition, boundaries, power, authority. Let me dwell in one minute on transitions. Gates are a symbol of change and transition. Moving from one sphere to another. Passing through a gate is like entering into a new space. Sometimes the separation is temporary. Sometimes it is permanent. Sometimes it is temporary. You can go back and forth through the gate. Sometimes it is permanent. Somebody goes through that gate and never has to come back through the same gate. To pass through a gate is to make a choice. To enter into a new phase of life. A new school. A new career chapter. Gates can represent the beginning and the end of, of a journey through life. Gates represent choices. Gates can represent new opportunities. They can represent new beginnings. I was just pondering about my daddy who went on to be the Lord. And it just occurred to me that God permitted his valedictory, valedictory lecture to become his, uh, his inaugural lecture over there. Amen. We wanted to listen to a valedictory, but heaven is receiving an inaugural. Praise the name of Jesus. Gate symbolizes boundaries, power, authority. Gate symbolizes the place where wars take place, battles. Battles occur at the gates. Life's fiercest battles happen at the gates. Genesis 24, verse 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said to him, our sister, May you become the mother of thousands, of tens, of thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Hallelujah. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 4 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 to 9. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So, one can have an open door, but at the gate, there are adversaries that says, the door is open, but you can't pass through. Every adversary that stands at any gate in my life and your life, that even though God has opened the gates, they say they can't pass through, they will bow in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They give way for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We will advance in destiny in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Very quickly, in five to ten minutes, men at the gates, three, two, three models. Number one, we've seen Abraham, and we've read his story, so we don't need to go back to it. At the gate, heaven met with us <laughs> because Abraham was found at the gate of his house. Men at the gate are men that are intercessors. <laughs> we are, the, the gate is where intercession is made to rescue the destinies of individuals. The destinies of families, the destinies of communities, the destinies of cities, the destinies of nations. Let me tell you this. The God I serve has an intercessor for every gate. Did you hear me? God. You may not have been praying for Ife. There are people who by the time we get to heaven, they will tell you, I never stop praying for the city of Ife. Because every city must have an intercessor, a watchman over it. Nigeria has watchmen over it. Some of us have been praying for Nigeria since 1985 and never stop praying. Nigeria shall be born again. Nigeria shall be born again. Because that's the gate he has placed us when it comes to intercession. Men are the gates where decisions of eternal consequences are made. What Abraham was bargaining with God had eternal consequences. You may be in a situation where the destiny of an undergraduate can be wrecked forever and he goes back to join the area boys or where the destiny can be remolded and a second chance is given and he moves forward and decades after he says if not for professor so so and so I will have abandoned academics you've had those stories before because there were men who knew their duty at their gate and who stood to ensure that destinies are not wrecked in their hands Men are the gate to admit and open or shut doors against the advancement of others. Men are the gate of promotion where equity, fairness, and mercy should prevail. Another man at the gate was Mordecai. And I recommend his story for you in the book of Esther. From Esther chapter 2, chapter 3, and on. 
Mordecai was a man at the gates. In actual fact, his job in that nation was to be at the gates. But apart from being found in his position at the gate, you know something about Mordecai? There was a wicked man by the name Haman. And every other person assumed that Haman was the best of characters. But Nehemiah saw into the spirit of Haman. I knew that this is a record of destinies. I don't know how he perceived it. But you know, whenever a man was passing, other people would koto to him. They were koto to wickedness. To, to koto means to bow, you know, to show reverence, to show submission. But Mordecai knew, no, no, no. The Israelites in me cannot koto to this one. And he refused to bow. <laughs> and Haman took him to heart. What's and he came to know he's a Jew. And Abraham decided, uh -huh, for the sake of this one Jew, I'm going to wipe out. And you know the rest of the story. The gallows that Haman intended to hang Mordecai. Mordecai, the man who knew what it means to stand at the gate. He stood at the gate when Vashti was removed. I said, Esther, I perceive something in you that I want to promote you I believe that God wants to promote you to that gate. And he mentored Esther and ensured that Esther became the queen. Esther might have felt, oh, it's because he's my uncle. No, he knew something deeper than that. Those who have studied the book of Esther know that Mordecai is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You know, so he knew more than what Esther knew. That no, Esther, it was later Esther found out in Esther chapter 4 verse 16, I mean, uh, in, in chapter 3, Mordecai told him, maybe you may not know that you are brought into the kingdom for a time like this. And Esther caught that message and said, if I perish, I perish. So, we have a thought character. Abraham was a man at the gate. Mordecai was a man at the gate. Mordecai motivated, encouraged, and lifted Esther to become a woman at the gate. Hallelujah. And she did not care for her life because she knew she was in the kingdom for that moment. And she risked her life, but she did not waste her life. Hallelujah. And we know the story. A whole nation was preserved and secured because of a woman who stood at the gate and decided, no, 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 I cannot allow, you know, my queenship to get into my head and the whole of Israel will be wiped out. What story do I tell my God? Who placed me in the kingdom for a time like this? Why has God brought you into the kingdom? Why are you standing at the gate where you are standing? At the gate of fatherhood. The gate of responsibility. As a mother, the gate of nurturing. The gate of growth. As a lecturer, you stand at the gate of knowledge. As a preacher, you stand at the gate of salvation and revelation. As a doctor, you stand at the gate of health. We are the health of human beings can either go here or there. As a nurse, you stand at the gate of compassion and care. As a judge, you stand at the gate of justice. As a driver, you stand at the gate of safety. How much am I earning? But the life of another human being or human beings are in your hands. Whichever way you turn the steering. As a leader, you stand at the gate of service and authority. As a teacher, you stand at the gate of knowledge. You are an impactor at the gate of learning. What gate are you standing? I will not want to go into the final part of the message. I think it will be another message. The gate of fatherhood. Because it will take us a much longer time. And I want us to, to dwell with this message we have had thus far. What's a gate? What's the significance of gates? What gate are you standing in? What are you doing there? Who are you standing with? Is it the gate of your house or the gate of Sodom? What are you doing at the gate God has placed? Do you even know that you are at a gate? Or at certain gates, going back to where I started. Our daddy stood at the gate of knowledge. He didn't hold knowledge. Transmitted it. Shared it freely. Didn't feel threatened. Raised up novices to become professors like him. He stood at the gate as a provost in the university. Brought transformations that are still affecting the postgraduate college today. He stood at the gate on this same altar. I don't know who could coordinate testimonies like him. Let's rise up to pray.
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Reflect, reflect over this message, reflect. If you want to sit down, sit down, just make sure you are reflecting. Don't let this message just fizzle away like any other message. Men are the gates. Not only men, but every one of us. What gate are you meant to be standing? What are you doing at that gate? Are you responsible? Are you available at that gate? Tell the Lord, asking for grace. It's not by power, it's not by might. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. Talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord. Whatever it is you want to say to Him, if all you want to do is to worship Him, worship Him. Yes, we enter into His gates with worship, with thanksgiving. Enter into His gates, worship Him. If you want to ask Him for wisdom, we are at the gate of wisdom right now. We are the gate of wisdom. Mekesko pranashti. Lesko preneski. Mandara wa shende gere bostoria. Mekaturia. We want to ask him for grace. Ye pakute pariyara wa shelea. You are the gate. When your decisions will affect your entire family. Bekutaska. You are saying, Lord, I must not take a foolish decision. At this gate. Mehasko preniskalia. Lehu tapradashti. Libo toske baria. You are the gate of a new beginning. Mehandara wa soria. You need fresh grace. Talk to the Lord. In your place of service, in your profession, in your vocation, others are working to earn salaries. No, you are at a gate. You are not just working to earn a salary. You are at a gate. Lives can be sustained and lives can go in your hands at that gate. Seporia Bashanda. Careers can progress and careers can be crushed at that gate. Because of your decision. Ask God for grace. Oh, release wisdom to me at this gate of my life. Pray as a father. Pray, pray, pray as a father. At the gate of fatherhood. Bekesko. Zemana Kashtori Abbas. You are a portrait. You are a protector. You are a provider. At that gate. Rekus Kabari Ashtali Abbasala. Oh, give me grace, Lord, to fulfill my ministry of fatherhood at the gate. You are a mother. Give me grace, oh God, to fulfill my ministry of motherhood at the gate. You are an elder brother, an elder sister. Give me grace to fulfill my ministry over my younger siblings in the name of Jesus Christ. There are elder ones that sacrificed their career, their education for the upbringing of others because they recognize the gift that they stood. Let me not be found wanting at my gate. Lord, let me not be found wanting. Let me not be found wanting. Let me not be found wanting. Give me every resource, every virtue, every grace needed to fulfill my ministry at my gate. In the name of Jesus. Separate me from every gate of Sodom. In the name of Jesus. Separate me from every association that is corrupted. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Almighty Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Almighty God and eternal King of glory, we thank you. And we thank you. And we thank you. Thank you for the message you have brought to us today. So once in a lifetime message. I pray, oh God, that this message will abide in us and abound through us and change and transforms all that needs to be changed in our lives and destinies in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us, oh God, to identify and to recognize whatever gates you have positioned us and to be equipped to fulfill our ministries at the gates in the name of Jesus Christ. So that when we stand to give accounts before you, our accounts will be worthy and acceptable in your sight in the name of Jesus Christ. On this side of eternity, O oh God, 
keep us to fulfill our roles and our ministry and our assignment at the various gates you have positioned us in the name of Jesus Christ Lord I pray for your church the Jesus Center Church the Christ Dominion Team International the gates of this church will not be broken by the enemy in the name of Jesus any onslaught or hell against your church they are dislodged in the name of Jesus Christ we as your church receive fresh grace for a new beginning to advance your kingdom much more than ever before in the name of Jesus and we declare that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us in the precious name of Jesus right from the pastor of the church to every unit head standing at one gate or the other to every father and every mother standing at the gates of our homes and our families father release fresh grace release the required equipment to be able to fulfill our responsibilities and our various gates in the name of jesus christ and where you have placed us at secular gates in our various vocations in our occupations in the organizations where we serve help us oh god to adopt kingdom principles to live as you lived to do as you will do and to leave our marks indelibly in the name of jesus christ i pray for my the younger ones oh god as they come into the reality of this message they will not be misplaced no bachelor here will be misplaced in marriage no spinster here will be mis misplaced in marriage in the name of jesus those you have ordained to go beyond the walls of nigeria to stand at various gates all over the world father locate them by your spirit move them not by sight like a lot who ended up in sodom but lead them by your spirit to where you have ordained for them to excel and to advance the kingdom and to manifest your glory in the name of jesus christ thank you almighty father you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that may ask or think according to your father works in us for we pray with thanksgiving in jesus precious name amen praise the lord god bless you thank you